The Voices of Kentucky Anna, hosted by Debbie Crawford. Music by Clay Beverly. Produced by Lynn King. Hello, this is Debbie Crawford with Kentucky Anna News, and we're here with Nina Alcorn and Jen Clayton. They have a unique thing that they're doing here in Madison for children and for our parents. It's going to be a wonderful addition to Madison, Indiana, and they're going to tell us more about that. We are a group of volunteers. Um, we started out as moms who play together and we formed a group called Friends of Hargan Matthews Park because we decided that um, we wanted to improve the park and create an all-inclusive play structure that will serve all children. Um, we actually inherited a nonprofit, Madison Youth Unlimited, and we are now raising money to match a $50,000 matching grant from the Community Foundation. We have until April 30th to meet this deadline. So we are working really hard to get donations wherever we can. Um, so any donation, too small, no, no problem. Five dollars, we're good. Um, we've also been going out to businesses and civic organizations to try to get donations um, from them as well. We've been to see the county commissioners, the city council, the parks department. We actually worked with the city um, and the parks department as a partner in this endeavor. Um, we really envision a safe play area with a nice fence matching Bicentennial Park, um, a riverboat themed structure for kids of all abilities, a soft surface um, to really make the park inclusive, and just some different play features that will help kids not only just to play, all be able to play, but to be able to play together as well. We also would like to see several swings, an art wall in the back of the park, um, hopefully with a piece of the kids on it, you know, tiles with their, their hands or, or some kind of um, imprint of the kids. Harvey Matthews Park is situated in a fabulous location. It's right downtown, right along the Ohio River Scenic Byway. Um, so you have a great view of the riverfront right there. Uh, it's walkable to downtown. It's walkable to the Heritage Trail. There's just so many great amenities on Madison's riverfront, and we feel like this would be such a wonderful addition to the riverfront area. We have established a Facebook page. Um, we're spreading the word. We're really um, getting our grassroots message out there via our Facebook page. So we would love for folks to go on Facebook to like us. We are the Friends of Hargan Matthews Park on Facebook, H-A-R-G-A-N Matthews Park. Um, and uh, they can pe people can also donate online. We have, um, it's a tax deductible donation. They can get to our donation page right right from our Facebook page. So we definitely encourage folks and to help spread the word amongst their family and friends. Um, we're a group of local volunteers. This has been a grassroots effort. Um, we actually inherited a nonprofit from two moms who had put it together to do a skate park um, around 2000, 2001. Um, and they kind of held on to that nonprofit until they found another project they wanted to pass that on to. So they heard about us and they asked us if we wanted a nonprofit, and we were all excited, and they voted us in, we voted them out. It's pretty simple. So, and so Western Lawn, if you're thinking just you know, geographically, it's parallel to Bicentennial Park, so it's literally directly across from the restrooms and then facing the river. So great location, very walkable, walkable to downtown, walkable to the Heritage Trail. <clears throat> uh, these are some of our committee members and partners in the project. Our goal is $200,000, and what do we want to do with $200,000? We would like to see an all-inclusive riverboat-themed structure on the playground. Um, we would like to have some other areas as well. We're kind of in the planning phases still of this, of the whole, the park as a whole. We actually recently um, added a landscape architect to our committee, which has been great because she's going to help us kind of envision the whole thing and put things together and really think in terms of pods in the park and how we want to make the best use of the space. Um, because our goal all along has not been just to flop a playground structure. We really want this to be, um, you know, a park that is going to be thematically matching bicentennial, matching the riverfront, um, you know, fitting in with Madison's historic district, etc. We want to continue the good work they've done on the riverfront. You know, we want to make sure that everything looks nice together. We also want to make sure that it's not just a place where kids can play, but they can really play together. Kids of any ability. So we also foresee, um, we would like a, a soft surface, a soft permeable surface, um, wh will, which will make it a lot easier for kids in chairs, kids with braces, um, any type of physical disability to be able to get to the structure and play on the equipment. 
Because a lot of playgrounds say that they are inclusive, but then when you have mulch, when you have different surfaces that you can't wheel a wheelchair, that a child with a walker can't navigate, um, you know, is it really inclusive? Mm -hmm. Not really. So that we feel like that's a, a very important part of the project. We're very, as this project kind of took shape, that became a real, um, concern of ours and wanted it to be a primary focus. If you talk to parents with kids with disabilities, they'll tell you, you know, when they're little and you can pick them up out of their chairs, you can put them in one of the baby swings, you know, it's fine. But when they start to get bigger, they can't participate. And that's that's not okay, right? It's not okay that they can't participate and that we don't have anything for them here locally. Um, the fencing we would like to just match Bicentennial Park. Uh, we envisioned an art wall in the back of the park, kind of where there's now a chain, link. a chain link fence and there's apartments on the other side. Uh, we would like that to be kind of a community effort. Um, we, we envision, you know, different uh, art groups coming together, maybe from the high schools, college, arts alliance. We really want to make that um, set like a community, maybe that more of the community build part of this project. And then permanent picnic tables, uh, recycling, trash containers, um, benches, etc. We've talked with several um, different businesses and organizations, and I know Ivy Tech is kind of the welding department is considering doing the, the picnic tables for us so that we can actually make them to the way our specifications <laughs> way we want. So there's you know handicap access on the side. Yes. And we love. Um, this is what we can, this is our rendering that we've had um, since we chose this this structure and you know our landscape architect brought, brought it to our attention that you know this swing is kind of out on its own and not really with the other swing so when we we're going to be sitting down very soon to work out more specifics like they said about the space so I don't know that we'll have this we had talked about um, a small boat that kind of trails dingy. a dinghy <laughs> I don't want to say the wrong word uh, a dinghy that sort of trails the riverboat that would be wheelchair accessible. So that's another option. And kids can get on there at the same time and kind of you shake it, basically. And, um, you know, there are different tables you can have that, you know, are on a certain level that all kids can get to them and access them. So we're really trying to think in terms of not just how they can all play, but really play and engage together. And you'll notice, too, there are a lot more swings at the rear. Um, currently, there are just two swings down there, a regular swing and a baby swing. And so, um, you know, often there's a line and toddler fights. And <laughs> Ashton, Ashton Webster brought that to everyone's attention last night. Sorry. There won't be any lines for the swings, right? Because there's so many people. Conflict resolution. So why this park, right? There's lots of parks. Um, why this park? First of all, the city has already invested in really nice bathrooms across the street. Anybody who has small children know that's extremely important. Um, it's, there's nothing like being at a park and somebody says, I need the bathroom, and you have to take them and run and figure out how to do that. So there's already bathrooms across the street. The visibility in this location, there's always people coming and going, and so there's a lot of recreation that takes place in this area. This is often the first park that people find when they're either visiting or moving to Madison. You know, the, the river is such a draw, they're down by the river, this is the first park they see. And the Parks Department actually has plans of possibly putting in a map in this playground eventually to where people can see where the other parks are. We actually have 22 parks, and people are always really surprised to hear that. Um, a lot of them have very small structures on them, though, usually for kids aged five and under. So, which if you're not familiar with the current park, that's what it currently has on it is basically a tot lot structure, just a small structure, and then the two swings in the back. And you know, they just <coughs> did that tot lot down the street um, by JC, so we think it's a great opportunity for this one to be more geared towards ages five and above. And you know, they have, you know, Main Street close by, Heritage Trail down the street, Bridge um, Walk down the street. Yeah. And then a lot of our festivals and events are happening right there at the river. They're happening at Bicentennial Park. If you are down there during River Roots or River Fest or any of those, you will see that park literally overrun <coughs> with, with kids. Anytime there's a decent day, you're going to see a lot of kids on that park. If you start to really pay attention, you will notice that there's always a lot of use out of that park. Quality of life issues, why, what, what are the benefits for our community? Um, parks are quality of life. People want to see parks. How do we bring in young professionals and get them to stay? Parks. 
quality of life type things like this. You know, we talk a lot as a community about brain drain, how do we keep our young people, how do we get them to come back to our community after getting their education. And you know, I know that that new generation coming up, those, those millennials are looking for quality of life amenities. They're looking for good schools. They're looking for recreation options. They're looking for um, you know activities for their young children. They're looking for parks. So we feel like this is this is really important, and that this you know that that the city could really leave a legacy by doing a project like this. We want this to be a place where people that are trying to recruit can drive young professionals by and say, "Look at this great amenity we have. We really care about quality of life in this community." Because if you look at other communities of our size, um, they do have these type of amenities. And so, you know, even just from a competitive standpoint, we think it's really important. So it also engages children of all socioeconomic levels, um, kids whose parents, you know, we found out, we recently went to here actually, the Indiana Youth Institute um, Youth Cafe. They talked about 25, I think it was 25.4% of kids in 2014 in, our, in Jefferson County live in poverty. So that means that, you know, the parents don't have the means to take them out of town to visit bigger parks, to go to museums, and things of this nature, which really foster that, that educational foundation that they need. And so a park like this, this will be an educational foundation for all children. They will all have a place to go and play and be creative and really learn, learn by play. Um, it promotes diversity and tolerance, like we said, socialization with kids of all abilities. And um, just kind of promotes a healthy lifestyle. There's already a, a, a big following down there. People like to go down and walk on the river. You know, this just gets, gives people more of an incentive to take their kids and go out, grandparents to go out and take their kids. Or when grandparents have their kids coming into town, they're like, where am I gonna take my kids? My grandkids that are here in town. And here in Southern Indiana, we also have an issue with obesity, particularly childhood obesity. So we feel like this is something that also, you know, addresses that need as well. How will we raise the money? We have, back in October, we got a matching $50,000 grant from the Community Foundation. Um, since that time, we have raised about $9,000, which is matching. Before the grant, we had about $10,000. Um, we have, we have, um, written numerous grants since then that were that are kind of out there still. We have we, some other possibilities that we feel like are going to come through and be matched as well. So. We have lots of balls in the air right now. Um, that's the best way to put it. We have lots of balls in the air and we are very hopeful that we will match that grant at the end of April. Um, and we have been recently to see the county commissioners. We got a very good response from them. We went to see the parks department a couple weeks ago, city council last night. So we're hopeful that we will get there. And honestly, we will get there because we don't plan to stop until we do. <laughs> um, it might take us long, but we, we think it won't. We think we're doing well. We right. think it'll, it'll, it'll happen. And I was just going to add to, in addition to going out to the business community, going out to private industry, we're also, um, you know, really trying to um, solicit just regular citizens. We have a Facebook page where you can donate directly online. Because we are a nonprofit, it's a tax deductible donation. Um, you know, so we're trying to spread the word that even every little bit helps. Five dollars here, ten dollars there. Um, you know, that's all going to go toward the park. We appreciate it all. So, no and the other thing I wanted to add too is we're, um, you know, we're really looking as well for in-kind donations. You know, we have a Jendi's Pizza Night coming up where Jendi's is going to contribute. 15%. 15% of the revenue from um, their sales. So, you know, if you are a business or if you know a local business who might be willing to partner with us in that way, um, you know, that's a great way to give back um, through in kind donations. Or wanting to do a fundraiser. Yeah, any type of fundraiser. This is the way the park looks currently. <laughs> As you can see, there's a small structure, um, like I said, for, for ages five and under. It's not a bad structure, it's in good shape, it's just very small. A lot of times it can be overrun very easily. Um, and then there are two swings. But you can also see the potential in this, you know, and how, how cool of a setting this would be and how we can really, um, we can really make this a really neat place uh, for our community and for kids to go. We want it to be a showpiece, not just meet so many needs, which it will, but also be just another showpiece for our city. Um, so this is a little bit outdated, but this is kind of where we are. Um, this is our vision of the art wall. This is kind of a fluid idea still. Like I said, we, we envision um, a lot of different 
uh, groups coming together to help us with this and make this happen. We also plan to sell tiles to families, um, and we're hoping that can fund a lot of it too. But we actually we have this budgeted in, but we kind of hope we're kind of hoping it sort of funds itself too. So these are just some ideas of of what we have talked about of what other communities and what other communities. <clears throat> There's a lot of history um, with riverboats. The city of Madison had two riverboats. One, of, one actually was very instrumental in the Civil War. So we plan to really try to incorporate that history into it, obviously the arts. This is what we've been sending out to businesses in our donation kit as suggested donation levels. Um, What we as a committee decided, this has been really hard for us and how to recognize donors. Um, because of the location being where it is, right in the middle of the historic district, and we want to make sure that we maintain the way things look and what all the good work that's been done there, we didn't want to say, we'll put up a giant wall, you know? So, which other, a lot of other playground groups, that's what they do. They, they just have a wall or some sort of sign somewhere, you know, that has all the donation levels. What we thought was, 500 to you know just below 10,000, we would have a banner because we've already kind of talked with the mayor about that and have the banner just hang in the park for the first few months that it's open. Maybe even see if we can get permission to bring that banner back um, and then for events for events that might be going on and then donations 10,000 above we would like to recognize on a pillar similar to Bicentennial Park. And then there are also opportunities, you know, if a particular individual or corporation would like to name, you know, even name the playground structure, name a certain piece, um, you know, there are opportunities there as well. By the swings, right. By your favorite spinny thing, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, things like that. Because that's kind of what we're trying to think about now is focus, like I said, on the different areas. And if somebody has something they would like to see in the playground and they want to fund that, then we are more than happy to talk with them and try to incorporate that in. We really want this to be as inclusive as possible. We want to involve as many people. We want the city to really take ownership of this park. So, thank you very much for coming today and, and eating our breakfast and listening to us talk. Does anybody have any questions so far? Yeah. When is the, the deadline for fundraising or when are you, when's your goal to end it? Um, well, our Community Foundation grant, the deadline is April 30th. So when we've been asked, you know, well, when do you want to start? Well, we would love to start now, but we don't have the money. Um, <laughs> so probably, you know, we, we are hopeful that maybe the fall, if things work out the way we hope that they do. If not, whenever we get enough money. We would love, because it is Indiana's bicentennial year, we would love to be able to kind of dovetail along with that. Um, but, you know, it just, again, it's going to depend on what we're able to raise. Sure. We are in the process of becoming a bicentennial project. Um, we are also Envision approved. Um, so that, that helps a lot, too. Nina, if I could say a word about uh, the alignment with Envision, because I know how committed the Chamber is to supporting Envision and aligning their mission with Envision. Uh, the arts and entertainment priority in Envision that Laura heads up, and you may want to say more about this too, has a, a plank under that support and encourage activities that use the Ohio River as an asset. And we think this one really falls under that category strongly with the riverboat theme. And also, it's such a collaborative project and really benefits the community for people of all ages and, and all segments of the community. So we do wholeheartedly it. And we feel like that really, you know, that we, we're very appreciative of that because we feel like that lends legitimacy to the project and that, you know, really, when people hear Envision, you know, that's something that they recognize. And so we're definitely appreciative of that. And obviously, the Community Foundation has been a key role in helping us get that legitimacy. Just uh, real briefly, just comment uh, next to you, but uh, our firm did a lot of the uh, design work on the riverfront and Bicentennial Park, okay. and we'd be more than happy to help in any way, shape, or form with you guys. Uh, great. This great because it's, uh, yeah, I agree, it's, it's crucial to have that kind of input into the community and makes it a, a much better place, a sense of place, so. We feel very strongly that, uh, it's hard to say one thing is a game changer, this could really be kind of a game changer in, in a lot of ways just because Madison has so much potential and they have so much of what 
millennials are looking for, the walkability, the historic downtown. You see these other communities like north of Indianapolis trying to recreate what we have here, you know? And, and we don't have the drawbacks in terms of traffic, in terms of congestion, we don't have those drawbacks. We have the access to three larger cities. So, you know, I mean, we have we have something, something great going on here and we feel like this could really be a, a big part of letting other people see that. I have a question. Yeah. How, with it being downtown Madison and a lot of festivals, I know use that park now. How, and like, my thought is during some of them, the crowds and the atmosphere get a little rougher than probably right. necessary for a children's park. How is that going to be protected? Because if it's nice and. Uh, we have talked with Riverfest about this. Mm -hmm. um, and they basically, they use it now for their backyard barbecue. Mm -hmm. But they have, you know, Kathy's just said, you know, yes, it will make a little us a little bit more difficult, but we will just we'll figure it out because we'll, they're so excited about having something like this. This can actually save the festival's money because they can use this space. They all have kids areas, right. so in the past they rented several inflatables and and had them in like the softball field area. They could rent one or two inflatables and have them in this area, you know, and, and this would be there for them to use, and they could block it off for those purposes. Um, I wanted to point out too that because it is a city park, the city will be responsible for maintenance. Um, I'm assuming that you know security as well during those type of events um, will also. We've had a lot of people ask about be concerned about vandalism and things like that. Um, that's kind of where the art wall came from, really, because we talked to a lady who knew of a group that did this in Chicago, and they they had had some vandalism. They decided to install an art wall where it really had an imprint of the kids on it. And that's why we like the idea of selling the tiles because that will have the imprint of the kids on it and they're just less likely to destroy it. Um, and there's a lot of, there are a lot of, of us on this committee who are working really hard. And I know that that's not a long-term solution, but I feel very strongly that if one of our group members was driving by and saw somebody defacing it, it would not happen. <laughs> I feel very strongly that we would stop that in <laughs> Um, and there's always so much traffic in that area, you know. So as far as visibility, I think that I think that that's it, it's it's very well lit on both sides of the road. So. And does it go all the way to that picnic structure that's already there? The silos. Yes. And the the little shelter. The shelter. Are, those are privately owned. Are privately owned. Yes. It's for sale, Thank but. You. We had talked about possibly approaching the owner of the silos to see if, you know, perhaps we could paint them, or paint them in some way. Um, I know that possibly the city had also been in talks with them. They'd be great timeout spaces, you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, the You're the big thing already. And there's spiders in there. <laughs> If you don't already, if you're on Facebook, if you don't already like our page, please do um, go and like us. We are the Friends of Hargan Matthews Park. We passed around some um, little flyers with upcoming events that we have um, coming up within the next month or so. Um, how can you know? We were at the beginning of this process. You know, Jen and I are, are, are journalism marketing people, and you know, we are not good at asking for money. But we are to the point now where we are not as shy about asking for money. If you or your, your family would like to make a donation, um, there are several ways you can do that. Or if you want to go back to your business, you may even have. We we distributed over 80 donation kits to local businesses. So if we missed you, please don't be offended. We've got more um, that we just made. So let us know, um, but go back to your businesses and talk with them about how you guys can get involved, or think about you know what you as a family could possibly do. You know, like I said, no donation too small. Let me say something that these ladies aren't going to say themselves. And, and when when we reviewed their grant application and talked with them, it was very clear that they were determined to do this. I mean, it wasn't a matter of if; it was a matter of when. And so, as you look at all the points that they mentioned, they're all valid. And, I think we all believe in it. But I think the key thing is that this was a citizen-led, uh, completely thing. No one, did, no one was getting paid. This wasn't, uh, hey, I want to make a name for myself. It was just people thinking that we could do better as a community and stepping in and doing this. 
And I think there's great power in it. I think that the message that the community should send is that we support that sort of work. And so to, to the extent you can go back to your business and, and, and help, please do so. The Voices of Kentucky Anna, hosted by Debbie Crawford. Music by Clay Beverly. Produced by Lynn King.